Welcome, Jack. Thanks. I'm uh, really happy to be here. All right. Well, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you to Pragmatic Leaders for having me on. I really uh, I appreciate the chance to get a chance to talk to you, uh, to you all about user-centric product management. So a uh, little introduction. My name is Jack Moore. I'm a product manager out here in Mountain View. I work on healthcare operations technology. And I specifically, uh, I specifically specialize in kind of the technical side of things, data science, data engineering, and how that and how uh, those kind of complex processes affect users. And so, uh, I, and I really love focusing on that idea of how uh, the technology that I build affects users. I think I've made a lot of choices in my professional life that have put me in a position where, uh, where I've prioritized companies that give me the chance to. Uh, to really affect users' lives. And so let's start with a quote that I'm, I'm hoping uh, some of us here are familiar with. This is a, a quote by Henry Ford. Henry Ford, of course, famous for revolutionizing the, uh, the product assembly line, particularly with cars. Uh, he was, he's very famous for, for essentially making cars accessible to the everyday man. And so uh, he's often attributed to, to this quote saying, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. Now, a lot of people point to this as a quote that, uh, that highlights how it is that, that we need to innovate. Uh, innovate. Um, this, is, this is kind of the mind of, of the Henry Fords and Steve Jobs of the world that innovation are things that people won't ask for. People don't ask for innovation and so talking to users isn't all that important. Uh, the issue, with part of the issue with this quote uh, is that Henry Ford never said this. Uh, it's, very, it's, it's very often attributed to him but there's no, no proof that he actually ever said this. And, and for Henry Ford, this, this idea of not really talking to users kind of, uh, kind of ended up uh, biting him back a little bit. They ended up hurting him. For 20 years, uh, for 20, 20 years, Henry Ford had he had a quote that he said, um, "People can have a car in any color so long as it's black." And so Ford was very much for a long time about let's build things efficiently, let's get as many cars out as we can. But eventually, uh, General Motors came about with the slogan that said, "A car for every person, purpose." And very quickly. Uh, as a result, Ford saw its 66% market share dissolve into a 15% market share and gave rise to firms like, uh, like General Motors and Chevy here in the U.S. And so what does this tell us as, as product managers, as product people? Uh, I think it, it, says, it says what I think is uh, the motto of the product manager, what I think is a, uh, how I define what a product manager's job is. As a product manager, it's our job to change the world uh, in some small way for someone. As product managers, it's our job to make sure that uh, that the users are uh, that users are, are really uh, seeing positive results as a result of the things that we're building. And it's our job not just to build things that we think people will like, but to look for experiences that people are going to love and build products to enable those experiences at scale. Uh, and this is if there's one point you can take away. From, from my talk today is that we want to think about how we can put users at the center of everything that we do. At the end of the day, we're here to serve users, and if, uh, and if they don't think that our product is bringing them value, then we will fail. One company that I think does a really great job, uh, does a really great job of this, of putting users at the center is Airbnb. And their, their CEO, Brian Chesky, is one of, the, one of the better storytellers out there, and we're going to hear him tell a little story about, about how Airbnb uh, came about as a result of, of incredible product focus. And this is a quote that I really like from them. At Airbnb, we strive to have our, co our customers contact the company and demand a sixth star be added to our five-star review because the experience was so good. Airbnb understands that their product isn't the website. It's not the Airbnb website. It's that experience that people have of using Airbnb booking a trip, connecting with their host, connecting with people all over the world, connecting with places all over the world. And they understand that that's, that is what's really, really special. And the best thing they can do is create a product that makes it, uh, create a website that makes it really, really easy for people to experience this amazing, this, uh, this amazing product, it makes it really easy for them to access these amazing experiences. And if you look at some of their, some of their product mantra, uh, there's a mantra of three clicks to booking. 
anywhere on Airbnb's website, you're three clicks away from having a paid booking. And so there's a, there's a video clip I'm going to show that I think highlights how Airbnb has came, come about and some of the thinking that Brian Chesky in particular has in, uh, in terms of uh, user focus. Notice it's actually an interview between Reid Hoffman and Brian Chesky. It's really, really great. But I'll, I'll jump into what he kind of talks about. Airbnb, uh, Brian talks about this, this idea of the 10 star experience. And so he realized that anything less than what people expect these days is a four star experience. If you show up to your Airbnb and your host isn't there to let you in, suddenly that's not a five star experience. And so in order to make sure that you are meeting users expectations and even going beyond users expectations, he has this technique that I'll share with you guys called the 10 star experience. And so for Airbnb, starting with five stars, this is the good experience. As you land at the airport, you somehow get to your Airbnb, uh, your host is there to let you in and show you the place and everything happens on time and it all happens smoothly. Then he thought about, okay, well, what's better than five stars? What, what would we need to provide in order for someone to want to rate us a six star experience? And so the six star experience is uh, you get to the airport and your host is there to pick you up and take you to your Airbnb. Uh, what's seven stars? Seven stars is your host sends a limo and your favorite brand of chips and your favorite soda is there in the limo waiting for you to take you to your Airbnb uh, where there is uh, your favorite magazine is waiting for you on the countertop. What's eight stars? Eight stars is you get off the plane, you get to the concourse and you see that there is a, an elephant coming around to pick you up and there's a giant parade to take you to your Airbnb. And nine stars. Nine stars is the Beatles experience. You get off the plane and there are 5,000 screaming fans waiting to greet you and you get swept off taking your Airbnb. Ten stars. Elon Musk shows up at your front door and offers to take you to space instead. And obviously now it gets a, a little bit a little bit apocryphal. Obviously it doesn't scale, but it helps it helps uh, to frame how it is that we can provide experiences that not just meet users' expectations but exceeds them. And so this is where we kind of get into, and this works, this technique, by the way, works for, uh, works for everything, anything that your users are experiencing. And the, the important thing, I think, to understand, and I think of, to, I'm going to keep coming back to this, is that the product that we're selling is not the technology that we're building. It's the experience that our users have in using our product. And so this is where I get into this idea of not just, don't just be customer focused, let's be customer obsessed. Let's try and put customers in the center of everything that we do. And so for the rest of my talk, I'm going to share a few techniques that I particularly enjoy around uh, making sure that, that customers are the focus of the things that we're building. Because oftentimes, it's really easy to think about product as a semblance of, of functional pieces, of pieces of technology or units of work that we need to do in order to build a product that we think is going to be cool. And then, at the, and then after all that, we wonder like, oh, I wonder who's going to use this and how are people going to adopt it? I hope people adopt it. But if we start with this customer experience and we use that as the guiding principle, as the, as the guiding notion of what product we're building, we're going to find that we're going to have a product that's much, much more successful. And we're going to find those people that love our product and recommend it to their friends. And so to start with, uh, with an example, another silly example, this is this is a website called Procatenator.com, and I think it, 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 uh, it encompasses everything that's great about the internet. Uh, you go to this website, and all it does is shows you a gif of a cat along with a random song. And <clears throat> and so um, and so uh, in terms of developing this product, we're going to talk a little bit about how we would go about developing this product from scratch. And so. Uh, this is starting with, with user story mapping. User story mapping is a really wonderful technique that, uh, that I enjoy using that helps me get away from, uh, from thinking about what are the things I need to build and instead thinking about what is the experience I want to enable. So starting at the top, you'll see that this is all in reference to a particular user. So I have a particular user in mind. Ideally, I've developed a, a user persona that gives a, a little bit more detail. And maybe I even have interviews. With, uh, with users that I think represent this user. And, and there's all others, yeah, it's research driven and helps me kind of give context to who it is that I'm describing with this, with this user experience. And then at the top, you can see user activities and user tasks. And these are kind of paired together. And left to right is kind of the, a time view of the experience that someone has using our product. And so 
Uh, it doesn't really matter what the particular product, but you know, here we're, we're looking at GIFs and we're viewing GIFs with music and then we're sharing those GIFs. And you can kind of see how we go along left to right, building and building out the user's experience. And then below that in yellow are user stories. So these are the actual things that we are going to build. And they're stacked by priority order and they're organized by release. And so with this, we can kind of say, what are the things we're going to build to enable uh, various steps of this user experience? And by doing that, it lets us really make sure that the product that we're using is not just is not just usable, uh, not just usable. It doesn't just create an experience, a coherent experience, but it lets us cut releases earlier. It lets us trim uh, trim to have really lean use, uh, really lean product releases that still provide value to users. And so the, this is a technique that works really really well with uh, with what you know common ways of doing of of doing you know, development, like for instance, I have a Kanban board here, but if you're using Scrum or some other technique, uh, extreme programming, whatever, uh, this pairs really, really well where these, users, you, these, uh, these functional pieces on your user story map translate one-to-one -one with tasks that you're actually trying to accomplish, trying to complete as part of your development cycles. And so this is a, it's a really great living document that can help, uh, that can help to share with your engineers what it is that you're building, and not just what it is that you're building, but why you're building it. It's really important, I believe, for engineers, uh, for engineering teams, really great engineering teams, to understand uh, what it is about your product that's going to make it valuable to users. And I think Marty Kagan is one of the, he's a great product development, product management in particular, uh, mind out here in the Valley, uh, talks about engineering teams, great engineering teams, respond to users in pain. And so even things as simple as just uh, putting, putting engineers in the same room as the user in pain can be really, really powerful. And tools like, so like user story mapping that kind of give context to that product that we're trying to build can really help to engage engineers and give them the opportunity to come up with ideas of what are these technologically advanced ways we can continue to meet users' needs. So the next, the next uh, thing I'll, I'll share with you guys, the next technique that I really like using is you know, now we have that user story map, how do we kind of organize it? How do we figure out what to build and what, what combination of things to build? Oftentimes, it's really difficult to figure out, you know, oh, should I build this, this really, really cool, uh, this really, really cool and innovative thing, uh, or should I just kind of make sure that my product does what all the other products out there do? And it's, it's an important balance to strike. And this is kind of how I think about it. This is called the Kano model of product development. And uh, it starts with it starts with basic needs. Uh, it starts with basic needs, and you'll see the the x-axis of this, the uh, the horizontal axis, uh, represents how much work you've put in, or how well you've executed on a given feature or set of features. And then the y-axis, the vertical axis, is as a result of building that, how happy are your users going to be? Like, what are your what's your users' uh, experience on your product going to be as a result of you executing on those features? And so, starting at the bottom with this orange line, you can see. Uh, we have basic needs. And basic needs are the kind of product features that you need just to get in the door if you want a chance at having your users use your product. And so for most products, these are things like a login feature. If you're making a photo sharing app, you gotta take, you have to be able to share photos. This is kind of the standard, uh, the standard feature set that makes your product usable at its core. And what you'll see here is that the line kind of bottoms out. So the more of these things that you build or the better you do in building them, uh, you get diminishing rates of return in terms of user satisfaction. And so think about the last time that you went home to your family and you told them about this amazing product. Uh, you told them about this product that you really, really love because of its login experience. Like, I don't know, I, I challenge anyone to think of a time when you've told your friend about an amazing login experience. I doubt it's ever happened. But if you ran into a product that didn't let you log in or the login experience didn't work, you're never going to use that product again. So then next up is performance needs. So these are things that scale, uh, scale maybe linearly. Uh, it's a good way to think about it. Not necessarily linearly, but these are things that the better you do, the happier you, your users are going to be. And so these are things like uh, speed, uh, time, of, time to delivery, Maybe it's uh, inventory, so Airbnb, it's like the, maybe the number of homes that are available. You need to have a certain number of homes available in a given area. For Netflix, it's the load times of their videos or the number of videos that they have available. 
those sorts of things. These are performance needs and uh, things that things that the better we do at them, the happier users are going to be. And then there's probably our favorite category. This is where innovation lives, I think, uh, most of the time in delighters. And so these are the net new things, the things that people haven't seen before that separate, these are what differentiate your product from, from others. And delighters, the more you do, the better you do, the happier users are going to be. And so for Airbnb, one of the delighters that Airbnb had, aside from, aside from the obvious of being a website where you could book a stay on people's couch, on a, uh, people's couches, which was fairly revolutionary, is that you didn't have to leave their site to pay someone. Uh, at the time, eBay, eBay had acquired PayPal, and, but you had to leave eBay and go through PayPal in order, uh, in order to execute a payment to, uh, to a seller on eBay. And so Airbnb had this really cool technological innovation where they allowed you to participate in this marketplace without ever leaving Airbnb. And so they created this experience that felt much more like a, like a closed community. And, and I think this, this is a really, valu a really valuable distinction to make because when you're looking at your user story map, this lets you kind of identify which, uh, which features you're building fall into, which, uh, in, fall into uh, each of these categories and allows you to prioritize accordingly and make a well-rounded product that's going to work, that's going to have enough basic needs so that people are going to want to use it, but then enough delighters that they're going to come home and they're going to come home to the family and say, wow, you really need to check out this product. This is, it's really amazing. And, and so then it's kind of getting into the nitty gritty. Once we understand kind of the features that we need to build, we need to write really good, really good requirements. And so it's really easy to write requirements like build a login function or we need a login. Um, or, you know, a button that does this. And the issue that you can get with that uh, is that it, it kind of cuts out the user. It's really easy to cut out the user when you're talking to engineers about what needs to be built. And so this is where we kind of get into the very basic idea of a user story. And the, one, one of the great things about a user story map is that it tells, the, it tells the story of the user. And so this user story is actually that. It's a story that you're telling about your user. And that's why this, this notion of as a blank, I want some experience so that some motivation. And, and this is a, it's a really great way to write requirements because it centers the whole conversation back around the user. It lets you say, hey, as a millennial, I want to take selfies of myself with dog ears so that I can show my friends how quirky I am. Um, and it's, it's a, this is a really great way, I think, to help engineers understand not just who your users are and what they want, but what their motivations are. And so I really think the, the so that clause of a user story is really, really important. And if you're having trouble filling those out, and a lot of times I think this is the part that product managers often leave out, it probably means you haven't done enough, uh, enough uh, research to understand your users' motivations or you're thinking about the product wrong and you're thinking about you're thinking about the wrong user and you're not really thinking about what it is that they want and why. And so then, and so then the, the last thing that I'll talk about is uh, acceptance criteria. And so how do we know when a feature that we built is done? How do, when is something done? And so this is, a, I think, a really great framework to help engineers understand how it is that we can test, uh, how is that we can test products and test features in order to center it back around the user. And so this is uh, it's called a Gherkin. And a Gherkin is a very simple tool. It's uh, given some precondition, when something happens, then something else happens. And so it's, it's really easy to start, to start a user story, and oftentimes I'll do this. I'll start a user story with a list of bullet points. You know, this, this feature needs to do X, Y, and Z, and then it'll be done. Uh, they're, they're really quick to write, they're really easy to write but oftentimes they don't really describe how to use the product. It doesn't describe how a person is going to be interacting with your product and what it is that they expect to see. And so it can be a little bit dehumanizing having a, just like a list of bullet points or a list of technical requirements. And so gherkins are a really great way to get really in depth and say, here's the experience that we hope to have. And by doing this, these, these translate really, really well to things like user acceptance testing and QA testing. And they make that process a lot easier. They, they do add a little bit of overhead in the process of writing tickets and writing user stories, but at the end of the day, they return dividends in terms of creating products that are easy to use, easy to test, 
and, and ultimately are higher quality. Uh, and so, you know, this is one example, given I've created login credentials and I'm on the login screen, when I type in my correct username and password, then I should be able to log in. Uh, it's a really simple way, it makes it really obvious how we can test this feature uh, to figure out whether or not it's, it's truly done. And so, um, I could I could probably dig in and share another dozen techniques that are out there for using these. But these are some of the ones that I think are really really core to again building that building that experience, uh, building that experience that's really going to make users love your product. And at the end of the day, the thing that we build isn't the product that we're trying to sell. The thing that we are trying to sell is the experience that our users have uh, with our product. If users don't know how to use it, or they don't enjoy using it, it doesn't matter how cool our product is or how revolutionary it is. Uh, we're just going to fail. And so success for product managers and for product leaders really comes in making sure that the user is at the center of everything we do and that we consider our product to be the experience that they have in using our product. Um, yeah, so uh, any questions? Yeah, feel free. Just throw questions in chat. I'll make sure I'll uh, I'll read them out, and then we can and we can talk about them. Um, and I'll I'll try my best to to answer them in the order that they come in. So, uh, first question is early stage. How do you prioritize between increasing uh, increasing UI UX uh, versus going for top line growth? So I think um, I'll take I'll take. Yeah, I'll take top line growth to mean like growing your user base. Is that uh, is that fair? Yeah, so I think this, going back to, to that video, and the, one of the things that Brian Chesky said it was key to Airbnb's early success was finding, uh, not just, not finding a million people that kind of like their product. And this was, this was advice that Brian Chesky got from Paul Graham, who's one of the co-founders of Y Combinator, who's a popular startup accelerator out here, um, and produced a lot of really, really great companies. Uh, Paul Graham gave Brian Chesky the advice that, Finding a hundred users that love you is more important than finding a million users that kind of like you. And the reason why that's important is because that hundred users who love you is really what is the seed that leads to viral growth. Uh, people, uh, users that love your product are going to share it with their friends and that, and then that scale just kind of happens. Uh, in Airbnb's case, what they found is that when they launched in New York and San Francisco, their users, uh, people would travel to those cities, come and use their use their product, and then go back to wherever they came from and become hosts. And by doing that, because they loved the product so much, they would become hosts themselves in whatever city they lived in. And that really, that really, really helped them grow their product. And so I would say, for the most part, for the most part, if you focus on the user's experience and you make sure that you have a product that people love and that they want to share, uh, you're not going to have to worry about top line growth so much because you're going to have found that experience that, that people love. And once you find that, then you can really get into, then you can really get into how to scale that. Once you've found that really great process, that, that really great experience that connects with people. And so let's see, next one. Cognitive load plays a very important role. How do you manage that as a product manager? Or would this solely be the responsibility of your UX team? Um, so, yeah, cognitive load. I think it's really it's really important to understand how people think. Uh, one book that I really love for this is Thinking Fast and Slow. Uh, it's a really great book that helps understand the difference between what called what's called System One and System Two thinking. So System One thinking is that kind of that gut reaction that you have when you see something. It's the automatic thinking that happens when we're when we're looking at a product in this case. Um, and I would say it's. If you have a UX team, that's a really, it's a really, really great thing, and they're a resource that you should leverage. Uh, but in no, in no means should the UX team be the sole arbiter of user experience and uh, and kind of usability principles for your product. They're they are part of the team. They're part. Of their, uh, uh, they're really valuable colleagues to have. But it's really important to understand as a product manager how users are using your product, and it's important to get in the same room and get face to face with the people that are using our product. Uh, and that, that really is what I think drives success. And um, next, next question. 
is um, where does it, where do advanced technologies like AI, machine learning, uh, AI machine learning fit into the role of a product management in UX? This is a really, really great question. Uh, this is something that I, I work with a lot. And so uh, machine learning, I think it's, it's, it's really easy to think of machine learning as kind of just magic pixie dust that we sprinkle on our product and it just kind of works in the back end and it makes cool things happen. But I think it's really important to understand the impact that machine learning has on user experience because it, it can be really profound. Um, and what complicates this a lot is that the team, a lot of times the teams that are developing the machine learning are a step removed from the user experience that it, that's exposing those tools. So for instance, at Amazon, the, uh, the team that develops the, the algorithms that recommend products on Amazon is not the same team that's building the, the, the wiki, the widget that exposes those recommendations to users. And because of that, it can be really hard. Your, your team is, is another step removed from the user experience. But as product managers, it's really important for us to help those folks developing machine learning and AI, how it is that the products that they're building affect users' lives. Because uh, I think at the, at the end of the day, it's really important. You know, the recommendations that are being exposed on Netflix are, uh, they, those represent 70% of viewership on Netflix's website. 70% of video views of viewership on Netflix's site comes from recommendations. And so it's machine learning and AI create a really profound impact on user experience, so at least they can. Um, what are the customer obsession metrics? Trying to understand what metrics will be uh, will be referred as customer focused metrics, but not customer obsessed metrics, or vice versa. Yeah, this is one. I actually have a I have a slide in my appendix that I will show you. Um, this is a this is a quote from Josh Elman. He's the VP of Product at Robinhood, and he gave this talk at ProductCon earlier this year in San Francisco called "The Only Metric That Matters." And I think this, this highlights kind of uh, highlights your question really, really well. And uh, success is measured, measured according to how many times your users perform a key behavior within an expected time cycle. And so for Airbnb, I believe their, their key metric is they want, uh, they want their users booking every six months. I think it's something like that. And they want to know how many users on Airbnb are booking a home every six months. Um, and so that kind of having that kind of core idea of success, I think, is really important for developing product. One of the first things, uh, one of the first things that I believe every product needs, every every feature, every new project that we that we undergo, uh, the first thing it needs is a really clearly defined uh, definition of success. A really really clear definition of success, and it needs to be measurable. And the first things we need to build are the tools to measure. Uh, to measure that that success if we haven't built them already. And so that I think in centering it around that, understanding what it is that our that our product is doing that's creating value uh, is is really, really important. and And I'll say furthermore, pairing those metrics with user research to say, here's why it's important that users are using our product and here's the value that they're getting out of it uh, is a, is a really powerful experience and can really help to drive home. The fact that success for us in building our product means success for our users. It means that we're going to be changing the world for the users in some small way. Um, any resources that you'd like to help us uh, build this skill? So this is, I believe, referring back to uh, increasing increasing UI UX versus versus scale, and and uh, resources that you'd like to share. So um, there, are, there are a few great books that I really, really like. Um, there is User Story Mapping by, uh, by Jeff Patton. It's a really amazing book, and I'll, I'll type it out. Um, User Story Mapping by Jeff Patton is a really great, uh, is a really great resource. It goes, in, it goes in depth to, it goes in depth into uh, some of these some of these tools for making sure that we're building a user experience that people really love and it helps to translate that idea of user experience uh, and user experience to engineering and helps to kind of bridge that gap. And um, another one is the uh, the lean product uh, lean product circle and the lean product playbook. The lean product circle is by Eric Rice and the lean product playbook is by Dan Olson. Those are a pair, another pair of, of really, really great books that can help to 
uh, in a really in a really lean way in a really efficient way figure out product market fit. Um, and I'll I'll share I can share a list of of these books uh, after the fact. Uh, and by the way, they're all on my they're all on my website. Um, if there is little feedback received from your users during development and proxy users is not that great of value, what kind of technique can be used to ensure great UX? Hmm. So there's little feedback received from users during development. So I think it's as product managers, it's our job to make sure that we're that we're eliciting feedback. And so and it can be a challenge sometimes. Uh, it's one of the reasons why uh, why uh, Marty Kagan um, is a, again a great a really great product thinker. He wrote Inspired, uh, a really great product management book that I highly recommend. Um, he likes to say that product management is a sixty hour a week job. It's not a, it's not kind of the traditional at least in the U.S. traditional forty hour a week a uh, week role. And part of that is because it's our job to kind of fill in all of these gaps, all the gaps that teams oftentimes don't know that they have, and a big part of that is, is user research. And so uh, in the process of our developing, uh, developing product, it's really important to do whatever we can to make sure that users are engaging with our product. Um, uh, bringing, yeah, bringing users in or going, going out to users. Um, yeah, going, yeah, going out to, and going out to users, I think. What's, what's really, really hard uh, about that is that oftentimes we really have to get out and go to our users and that can be really difficult and it can seem inefficient. Um, but again, not to, not to, I guess, chime on Airbnb. I'm not some Airbnb disciple, uh, but I have done a lot of research for this particular talk. Um, one of the things that Brian Chesky and his team did when they were at Y Combinator is that they commuted back and forth from San Francisco to New York because New York was where most of their users at the time were. And so they actually commuted multiple times a week back and forth from, from San Francisco to New York and uh, in order to go and talk to their users face to face. And so they would go, they would stay in their homes and, uh, and they would help them like take photographs of their, of their homes. And, they, and that's how they really uh, came to understand how it was that they could build a user experience that is that is really really uh, really really powerful and amazing, and uh, so I, mean, I think that's it is it's a, it's a really big challenge. But I think it's our job to make sure that we get feedback. Next question: zero to one or one to one hundred? Which one's harder? Um, that's tough. There, I think I think the these concepts it's it's they're two very different challenges. Uh, going from zero to one, and if you haven't read the book Zero to One uh, by Peter Thiel, again, I think I've, I've made about a dozen book recommendations, so you all have some homework to do. But, um, but going from zero to one is a challenge because you're, you're trying to build something out of nothing, and it can be really, really hard. The company that I'm at now, Cuventus, went, <clears throat> I believe it existed for three or four years before it ever uh, got its first, its first real uh, contract with a, with a hospital. And, and so it can be really hard. It can be a struggle. Uh, it can be a struggle to, to kind of build products that people like. But zero to one, I think, represents that kind of product market fit. And maybe it's not one user. Maybe it's you know, maybe it's actually ten or a hundred or you know something like that. But finding finding users that really love your product and building a product that people that anyone loves is really difficult, and that's a challenge. And then going from one to one hundred or scaling that is also really tough. And it's a very it's a different skill set. So figuring out how is it that we take this experience that people really love and how do we provide that at scale for everyone? And that can be, that can be really tough. So, I mean, think about something like Netflix in its early days, they were just, they were mailing DVDs. It's really easy to prototype that at small scale. Uh, it's really easy to just have a, you know, like a, a blockbuster or a store in town that maybe you're even driving around delivering DVDs to people's houses. And that's a really, it's a really easy experience to prototype and build at small scale. But, uh, and that kind of, and it's really easy to get to that, or maybe, you know, maybe not easy, but you can get to that zero to one, but then figuring out how to then, how then do I provide this service to people all around the world is, is a challenge. And so they're, I feel like I copped out on your, I feel like I copped on your question, kind of punted, but they're both really hard. They're both really hard. They're both very different. Let's see. I don't think I've missed any questions. I think that's, that's, all 
uh, the questions that have been asked so far. So if yeah, any more any more questions, I can uh, I can hang around for a few minutes. And in the meantime, I will share some of these book recommendations that I've made. All right. Well, very cool. I think uh, if, oh, any advice. Yeah, cool. Oh, this is a great question. Any advice to PMs at an enterprise level company? It seems like we're too big to make a difference. Oh, no. All right. Um, <laughs> I know it's so sad, but uh, I so I've, I've been where you I've been where you are for uh, for the first two years of my product management career. I worked at uh, a large public utility. Uh, like providing gas and electric to, to people. And if you want to find a company that moves slowly and that has, that's where people are weighed down by bureaucracy, that is, that's the place to find it. Um, and it can be tough. It can definitely be tough at an enterprise level company. I think uh, oftentimes the challenge for us is to, is the challenge for us is to challenge that structure and figure out ways uh, figure out ways that we can kind of create value outside of the lines. And so um, one of the things that I, that, well, one of the things that, that I like to think about is uh, starting, a, starting a startup within your company. And this is uh, something you can, you can kind of do it just like as a team. There are a lot of teams that talk about themselves as a startup within their company, but um, it, it's actually, I've, I've seen it a couple of times where at enterprise level companies, They've actually spun, you know, they spin up like internal internal startups, uh, companies that essentially have, you know, quote unquote like venture funding, like internal venture funding, and they kind of they get their shot to build this thing. I think I think though that uh, it is possible to build a grassroots movement at an enterprise level in terms of user focus. I find that many enterprise level companies don't do a great job of focusing on users. There are a handful out there that do. I think you know Air, Airbnb, Uber. Um, Netflix, Amazon, Facebook are all really famous for the processes that they've put in place to allow for user for user testing and, and user experience focus at scale. Uh, for instance, if you're an engineer at Facebook, you have the ability to uh, build something, to independently build something, deploy an A-B test that, that maybe puts your uh, feature change in front of 10,000 users and then measures a suite of usership metrics that they deem to be important and then just kind of generates a report. And you can take that to your product manager as the engineer at Facebook, you can take that to your product manager and say, uh, here, here are the results, here's how users responded to this feature change that I made. And that's really, that's really powerful. I think pushing and building that grassroots movement for, uh, for doing things like interacting with users and doing things like A-B testing uh, are really are really powerful, and you can help your company meet that kind of what what uh, I've heard experts call the uh, the experimentation inflection point of the experimentation singularity, where they suddenly understand how to, how much, how important testing is and how important you know getting in front of users is, and they start doing it a lot more often. Um, for B for B to C, uh, it's easier to. Uh, it's easier to reach and take feedback from users, but what about enterprise or B two B? Yeah. Um, so I, as as a product manager, has only ever really worked in B two B settings. I definitely, I definitely can understand uh, where you're coming from. And the 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 first thing I'll say is that the diff there's a difference between uh, users and customers. And so uh, a user is the person who is using your product, and a customer is the person who's paying for it. Uh, in consumer software, oftentimes that person is the same person. The person who's buying the product, the person who's making the purchasing decision is the same person that is actually using the product. Um, the, 
the the thing to the thing that's understand I guess about about B two B, um, and getting feedback is that it's it becomes even more important to to understand to build a really particularly a really metric driven understanding about how it is that users are getting value from your product. It becomes even more important, and so. Um, building a relationship with your customers, with the people who are paying for your product, so that you can get in front of users is really important. And then taking stories back to them, showing them the data, saying, here's how users are getting value from our product. And then also telling them stories, because stories are really powerful, telling them stories about how it is that, that, that the users of your product are getting value from it. And that can really, that can really help to get customers, your customers on your side. Uh, what if the pivot or the A-B testing gave you wrong results? Uh, in spite of hearing and implementing customer feedbacks and revenue starts decreasing uh, or the pilot test. Yeah, so I think, um, I think with, with, testing, uh, with testing, you have to know that failure is always an option. And so uh, understanding, understanding that can be, it can be tough. Um, but in, I think this maybe isn't in zero to one, but it's a, it is a quote that I heard from Peter Thiel and Peter Thiel once said that, um, yeah, Peter Thiel once said that, uh, he prefers, he prefers to not fail, but if he has to, he wants to know why. And so, um, a lot of times it's, it's really important that, uh, that we fail fast. I think someone in chat just said that, uh, it's really important to fail fast. Ideally, you can do a lot of this testing before the point of dedicating engineering resources to, to something, uh, even in small scale testing. So, you know, things like functional prototypes can be really powerful for that. But uh, at the end of the day, I think it's really important to have uh, to have things like metrics in place that help us understand that helps understand how how people are interacting with our product and where it is that they're that they're falling off. Um, because yeah, it can definitely be really frustrating when we get uh, getting to the point where we built something and then putting it out into the market and finding out that people don't like it. Uh, and so it's really important to figure out what are some of the what are the ways that we can figure out whether or not people like our product before we before we throw it out to them. Um, and I'll also say, uh, kind of going back to that B two B, going back to the example of of B two B. Oftentimes, things like A-B testing aren't really techniques that we have the option to use. Sometimes that's, sometimes that's the case. And in those cases, then you start, into, you start to get into uh, ideas of like traditional opt-in testing, like alpha and beta testing. And those can be really great, those can be really great techniques for, uh, for figuring out how it is that your user is going to respond to your product. And then uh, obviously you have, you have more early stage techniques like uh, like focus grouping, like you know, just in person in person wireframing. I think even like pen and paper, uh, like pen and paper construction paper prototyping is something that places like Google uses. Um, and then I'll, I'll throw another book out there because why not? Um, Sp uh, Sprint by the team at Google Ventures is a really good book. Um, is a really good book and talks about this kind of very lean process of figuring out whether or not users are going to like the, the product that you're building. And it gives this kind of, it, it's this really cool five day, uh, five day process for um, going through and, and testing, uh, figuring out an idea and then putting out a prototype and figuring out whether users are going to like it. Yeah. Okay. So um, someone asked me to share my journey to, to product management and how it's been so far. So um, my my first exposure to product management, I was fresh out of school, uh, and I had I, I graduated with a degree in electrical engineering, and I moved out to San Francisco, thinking that California would be fun. It is, um, and I started working at a big public utility as an engineer, and I quickly realized that I did not like engineering. And so I was really lucky then to find myself uh, to to move to a team that was building data visualization and uh, data visualization and data insight uh, tools for operators. So these were building tools for internal users. Um, and 
uh, and that that's where I really got an exposure to product management. And I did a lot of things like, like spending a lot of time in, in really hot operating rooms with uh, with these uh, these grid operators yelling yelling across the room. It was a very high pressure situation, but these were the people that I was developing product for, and so it was important for me to be in the room. And uh, and it was funny because I had to go out into the desert where these operating centers were, and uh, and I, I kept telling my boss like I really want to go. I really I need to I need to spend more time out there. And he was like, you you want to so let me just make this clear. You want to leave San Francisco and you want to go spend time out in the desert with these. Uh, with these users, I was like, yeah, yeah, absolutely, and and so that, that was that was kind of one of my formative experiences as a product manager, and then from there, I from there I found myself working on uh, working on things like data science. I think data science is something that's really interesting, and where I've kind of arrived now is uh, trying to find products where I feel like I'm really impacting people's lives, and that's where I get into that my my kind of mantra there of uh, the product manager's job is to change the world in some small way for someone. Um, what I'm doing now, what I'm doing now at, at my current company, Cubentis, I think is really, really cool because we're helping to optimize the healthcare process in the US. And that's really important to me. Uh, it's really important to me the, in that uh, what, our, what our team really does, what our team does really well is tying our users to outcomes. And so we can say, uh, we can say that as a result of putting this product out in this particular hospital, we reduce patient length of stay by a third of a day on average. And that's, and that's a really cool thing to be able to say. And, uh, and that's one of the things that's really important to me as a product manager is being able to understand why, uh, understand what it is that we can build that's going to be valuable to people. And then making sure that we put in the tools to make to to measure that, and we have the techniques to be able to say definitively, here's the impact that our product has on people's lives. And one of the other things that I'll that I'll say I'll recommend one of the things that's been really big, uh, really powerful in my product management um, in my product management career has been writing. So. Uh, I started blogging about product management about two years ago, and it's been really, really powerful. Um, most of the time, I, I started off just kind of writing for me. I wanted to, I wanted to make sure that that I understood the concepts that I was learning, and writing about them was a great way for me to force myself to do all the research that I needed to do in order to sound really, uh, in order to sound really legit, and so. Uh, I would say, even if you're not sharing with anyone, though I recommend sharing it, uh, I would say that the writing and building that that written communication skill is really, really powerful, uh, really valuable for product managers. So another question, what role does passion have in the success of a PM? Do you think that you need to be passionate about what you're building? I think, I think, uh, I think passion is really important. I think that uh, because product management is that kind of 60 hour a week job, um, you need to you need to be passionate about what you're doing in order to really be able to pour yourself into it to the degree that I think a product management a product manager probably needs to in order to be successful. And I I'm, I don't agree with this notion of of passion as something that you that you find. I think passion is passion is something that I think you cultivate. I think that um, if you find a place that is, uh, I think more about uh, more about outcomes that I think are really interesting than products that I think are really cool. So I think it's it, it is it is neat to be in places that are working on like machine learning and they're using things like machine learning and AI to 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 do some to do cool stuff. But I think where uh, where I where I really what really resonates with me is building experiences that that are really valuable to people and um, really creating creating value. So my current company, what really resonated with me wasn't the fact that data science is really core to what we do, though that was really cool and that was an add-on. It was the fact that we were, um, it was the fact that we were really affecting people's lives. And you have to be passionate about those outcomes. I think being passionate about user outcomes is really important. And that if you're and if you're passionate about user outcomes, you're going to figure out a way to solve their problems in an interesting, an interesting and technologically innovative way. 
how important uh, how important are technical skills? Huh, thank you, Catherine. I appreciate that. So, uh, question: uh, How important uh, are technical skills in helping in my day to day? Um, I think at a base level, product management is a is what I, I like to say it's a mile wide, foot deep sort of job. Um, at a at a base level, you need to understand a little bit about everything. You need to be able to you need to know enough design to interact with designers. You need to know enough code to interact with engineers. You need to know enough data science to interact with data scientists, etc. Um, with the technical things in particular, the technical things I think get a lot of attention because they're very high profile and they are core to what makes a product a product these days. Um, you need to understand enough about the code that you can understand, that you can explain it to your grandma, what, what you've built. Um, you need to understand enough about the data science to explain at a high level to a, to a business stakeholder. Um, yeah, to, to be able to understand to a business stakeholder what it is that you've built and why it's really cool. And, uh, and, and I think it, it, yeah, and it's, and it's helpful to have that technical knowledge in order to be able to give, to have a kind of a notion of technical feasibility. So I think products, products need to be uh, technically feasible. They need to be whatever feasible, usable, scalable. I forget what the, the third one is, but uh, that kind of technological feasibility is really is really important to be able to kind of have that radar. And uh, uh, there's this notion of like of technical product management, and I think there's a, a lot of times a lot of times it, it gets talked about like there are technical product managers and then there are not technical product managers. And I don't think that's really the case. I think it's it's really uh, it's really a scale. It's really a spectrum, and you have to figure out how technical you need to be in order to succeed in the in the environment in the organization that you're in and that can depend a lot on like what who are the people around you uh, what are the people around you what is the technical understanding of the people that you need to explain this stuff to um, and uh, but yeah I mean I, I, I do really believe that, that uh, it's valuable for a product manager to be able to roll up their sleeves and build some of the things that their engineers are, are building and so I've I've done I've done a little bit of of that kind of like data science, I have I've developed some some data science, and I I know Python and things that I, coming from I have like an engineering background, um, not necessarily computer science, but an engineering background where I did get to learn some code in a university setting, and that was very helpful for me. And I think that every product manager should probably take a, a at least a basic programming course. I think it, it's it's a really powerful core skill to have. If no for no other reason, you're going to understand some of the weird terminology that comes out of your of your engineering teams. Yeah, thank you guys. This has been really fun. Thank you. Thank you, Jack, for joining us. The session was really helpful. And I hope everyone enjoyed it. And I would like Yeah, to I hope so too. I would like to take a minute before we end the session. Uh, we have a very few interesting sessions lined up for this month. And I hope to see you all there. Uh, and uh, I would like to tell you about Pragmatic Leaders. We are working here to bring the product discourse to the forefront. If you are looking to transition into product management, we are happy to help. You can reach me anytime. I'll share my mail ID and you can read Jack. Uh, he is always available. Yep. Yeah, yeah. If any, any questions, please uh, don't, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, yeah, th thank you guys all for, for taking some time to listen to me talk. That was nice. <laughs>